Hello everyone, welcome to your first session and welcome to the TDC Group Auditorium. We hope you enjoyed the opening speech by the Danish Prime Minister. Before we begin, I have a few practical announcements. Each session begins with a personal presentation by the speaker and is followed by a Q&A session with you. During the Q&A session, you can ask questions in two ways. First, simply by raising your hand, and I will provide you with a microphone. Secondly, you can use our online Q&A tool, Slido. Simply go to slido.com, enter the event code ASIM2016. Remember throughout the day to select the right auditorium. We strongly encourage you to participate in the debate and ask a speaker questions about their presentations or this year's theme. And please note that we have a competition for the best question asked on Slido, but also for the best picture hosted on Instagram using the hashtag ASIP2016. And now we're ready to begin. So please help me welcome our moderator for this session, journalist and anchor at TV2 Business, Joachim Binslew. Um, thank you very much for the, the kind presentation and the warm welcome. Uh, I'm not used to that at TV2. Um, just a, a short on me, I'm 30 years. I've been working as a business journalist for about four or five years. Um, I just turned 30 uh, this weekend and I'm having a big party tomorrow with the boys. So this is a great warm up. Um, I had heard about Lars Fjellsø Nielsen um, during my work as a, as a journalist in the last couple of years at Børsen and TV2 as well. But I didn't know his profile that well. Um, so I did some research on him when I, uh, I was asked to do this. And I was just thrilled about uh, that Lars was the guy. I was, uh, I was chosen to moderate because he's, uh, <laughs> he's just really impressive and, uh, and a massive uh, Inspiration. I, uh, we talked uh, last week, and uh, I just heard about this venture capital guy from London, expected, you know, real corporate guy, and he was just this laughing, very kind, uh, interesting guy, and he sent me some videos, and I was just thrilled. All he wanted was to, to have fun and, and inspire uh, everyone um, around him, and I just found that uh, so great and, and promising. Uh, he's 43 years old. Uh, been known, been called the godfather of mobile digital business. I can't wait to, uh, to hear the presentation. Uh, everyone give a warm welcome to uh, Lars Fjellsø Nielsen. <laughs> well, I was going to do this in Danish or English, so I thought I'll do it in English with a very strong Danish accent. <laughs> and this is something I can't get rid of. Um, over the last 17 years, I've been in startups and I've been representing American companies in Europe and I've been going to America and uh, really uh, going global for those companies. So, you know, we, we have about half an hour and I want to take you through this journey. There's like 17 years in half an hour. And it's, it's about this four dimensional shift that I've gone through from being an entrepreneur to become a venture capital and from being in Silicon Valley by San Francisco and come back to Europe. So it's, it's, um, it's been a crazy story and I hope I can uh, help with uh, you know, some questions that people have in their mind around like, you know, what, what is it like to be in the valley, you know, a lot of people are, I'm sure working on companies and already know what it's like to work in companies, what is it like to work in really explosive like growth companies. So the, the lens by which I look at the world and sort of the, these four dimensions starts with the companies that I worked at. So I was uh, very early at Dropbox, I was one of the first 20 odd engineer, 20, 20 something, I can't call myself an engineer even though I am. And I started there when it was just about to take off. Then I went uh, and became an advisor at WhatsApp. And this was uh, before the acquisition by Facebook. And uh, then from there I went on and uh, I became vice president at Uber in California while we were in about 20, 25 cities, something like that. 
today, you know, if you look at the website, it's in, it's in hundreds of cities and of course, of course everywhere. So that's really, that's sort of like a lens and that's something to really think about when you look at the world. Like what's the lens that you have that you use to look at the world? Like what's the filter that's on top of the world that you see? And some of the things that I sort of um, took time to think about coming back to Europe and having just left Uber exactly a year ago this, uh, this, uh, this year, like a year ago this week uh, was when I came back to Europe. And it was really like, what were some of the common denominating factors? What were some of the, the commonalities between these three companies that, that we can all take away and we can all learn from and try to apply that to companies when we think about uh, building something? And it starts with the team, goes to the product, monetization, and finally timing. So I think it's maybe worthwhile just spending a little bit of time talking about that. First of all, on the team, it's a very nebulous thing. And when you talk about, okay, what's a good team and so on, I've, I've really distilled it down to what's the culture of the place. And the common trait about all these three companies was they had very, very strong cultures. They were all different sizes. They were working in different industries, different CEOs, and the company's culture were very, very different. But the, the common trait was they were all strong. They were very, very strong cultures. And culture is something that's really difficult. It's a very nebulous term. Like, I'm sure if you ask uh, anybody in this room, what's the culture here? You will come with, everybody will have different answers. But having sort of like a, a North Star as sort of a template to work to, like when you think about hiring, when you think about how you behave, etc., it's sort of like the culture is really the personality, it's the soul of the company. That's the best way that I can find to describe it. And then from culture comes execution and so on. And at the end of the day, it's all about execution. I mean, I think we would all agree, wouldn't it be fantastic if we could just go outside, press a button, and we'd fly up to Mars, and we'd have lunch up there and have fun jumping around. So and then we come, we come home for dinner. It's just be another day at work. But guess what? It's all about execution. It's really about A lot of people probably have that idea already. So, so that's about the team. Uh, the product, it's all about simplicity. So they are obsessed with simplicity. And this is where it's with Travis, sort of like his product mantra was, it's as reliable, Uber should be as reliable as running water. For WhatsApp, Yen, the product sort of mantra was, no bells, no whistles. It should just be super simple and clean. And for Dropbox was, it always works. And in fact, it always works to such an extent that you don't even know that it's working in the background when you're syncing a Dropbox. So that's the product. That's sort of like this simplicity obsession. On monetization, I think about it as a, um, as a scale. On one end of the scale, you have Uber, which is just a money machine. On the other end of the scale, you have WhatsApp, which is all about growth. And in the middle, you have Dropbox, which is sort of like this freemium, premium morphing. So it means you get 500 million people to use the service, and hopefully they will upgrade and start to use it at work, etc. And one other really interesting thing, and this is something I would encourage you to think about when you think about products, is all these three products are used both by us at home but also us at work. So it means it really flows between the two. And even though you know, we're maybe one persona when we're at work and when a certain culture so, so on, when we're at home, we still use the same service and vice versa. That's really, really powerful. Because then suddenly you own a part of the brain that's associated with your service, right? With Uber, when I think about transportation, I think about Uber. When I think about messaging, I think about WhatsApp. When I think about syncing, I think about Dropbox. So it's like, which part of the brain is it that the product really owns? What does it trigger? Which action does it trigger? Which is really another thing that's good to think about. Um, and then finally, timing. That is the, the most nebulous of all these four elements, but maybe the most important. I mean, I've worked at companies that were way ahead of their time and they just failed, they blew up. And then yet, a few years later, you see exactly the same thing and it blows up, but um, in a very different way. So this leads me to the second lens that I have, which is um, as, as a venture capital. So moving from being an entrepreneur to a venture capital, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very different um, way to look at the world, look at the same thing. So I'm a general partner at Balderson Capital. We're based in London, 
And we're one of the largest uh, venture capital firms in, in the very early stage, so what we call Series A, which is just when the product is starting to get product market fit, which means you're starting to get the signals, hey, people like the service. You know, we're getting some money coming in. That there's like a good loop, there's an interaction. We're starting to own this part of the brain that's associated with the service that, that we're investing in. And we have, um, you know, we have 2.3 billion under management, 87 companies in our portfolio. It's all in Europe, we focus on Europe. And the team is, it's a bunch of entrepreneurial folks. So it means it's people who've been out there building companies before. And that was one of the things that attracted me to go into this particular firm was it was people who had been there before. They, they, you know, they'd lost an arm, they lost a leg, they lost their head, whatever. And it was all had battle scars, which is really useful, right? When you sit next to somebody who's building that firm. But, you know, one of the things that I thought a lot about in coming back to Europe was, you know, how, how, can, I, how can I come back and contribute with something? And for me, I truly believe that startups are the growth engine for European prosperity. I want to repeat that. Startups are the growth engine for European prosperity. I really believe in that. And so the 11,000 jobs here is part of the answer to, to my question that I asked myself, like how, how can I come back and help? And I can, my conclusion was I'd be an awful professor, <laughs> you know, I would be an even worse politician, but you know what, I've seen something with startups and I think I can come and help and you know, if I can give some money to contribute and accelerate the growth of these startups, which in return creates jobs and opportunity, I think that's something I would be, feel quite proud about. Something that I would like to be associated with. So, you know, f when you look at Europe from the US, from the Valley specifically, you hear about Brexit, you hear about, you know, um, um, Greece, uh, you hear about the refugees and all this stuff, but the really interesting thing is if you ask like any major um, sort of venture capital firm right now, they, they would, everyone would have a slide like this that shows, you know, $44 billion worth of exits created in 14 to 15. So Europe is creating billion dollar, jo billion dollar companies at an increasing rate. People may have different companies listed here and so on, so don't take that as, as sort of like very specific. But everyone would agree on that trend, that Europe is really happening. And this all came out of 2008. This was when, you know, the subprime mortgages blew up and suddenly, you know, lots of loss of job, lots of loss of, of value. And people start to think about new ways. How can we create something new? And then we saw from Europe, we saw people in the US like, really be very uh, successful and really sort of, you know, hit the headlines, very inspiring at the, at the core. So, you know what, we can do the same. I want to be like that. And that was when I moved over to the Valley. And at the time, mobile hadn't really started yet in the Valley. It was all about all the engineers were working on the web and very few people working on mobile. So that was, from a timing point of view for myself, that was a very um, a lucky moment because suddenly I was the mobile guy in the Valley. And uh, 2008 was also an Android launch, 2007 the iPhone launch, so there was really mobile was starting to be something of interest. So back to, to sort of like the timing of, of when to launch something. And you think about what's going on in Europe now, I mean I think you would probably all agree with this, there are all these tech hubs going on. And you start to see clusters of uh, information we were talking about earlier, like the healthcare. So we have large healthcare companies. You know, we have Novo Nordisk and them, etc. You know, on the way from uh, from the airport here, we saw uh, Vestas, another example, like with the clean tech and so on. So you start to see these clusters of um, knowledge and clusters of passion, and then you see really things start to grow from that, and that's happening everywhere in Europe. You go to Switzerland; it's about data security. It's about how can you make something secure? You know, Scandinavia in general is mobile. I'll talk about that a little bit later. You know, London is maybe, uh, there's a lot of fintech going on there, right there, uh, right now. And you have all these clusters. And the really interesting thing is, all the cities, all these clusters are rising at the same time. 
It's really amazing. And, 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 and I think part of the reason for that is because we're all sort of like seeing the same news, we're reading the same news, we're seeing the same people, and everything is happening at the same time. So one question that people often ask is, so, so what's the difference between the Valley and Europe? What's the opportunity? I mean, first on a very high level, the density versus the spread of the population. The Valley is only three million people. It takes the same amount of time that it takes to drive to the airport from here. I mean, that's how small it is. And of course, Europe, 500 million people, and you know, you could include Russia in that, and, and you blow through that number. And, but the thing the valley has is there's this density. It's like, I mean, think about the mass, think, think about the core of the sun. There's this gravitational force happening in the valley where that's creating all this friction, this heat, this momentum, this energy. And that's really feeding. So you can't do anything without bumping into anybody or to someone who is doing something, some, something with tech. It's very energizing. You get super inspired. There's an incredible energy. And in Europe, we have that in these micro densities. So it means in every single hub, I mean, just look at here at all the symposium, how we get all these people together to, to work on and, and sort of like think about a topic and, and, and sort of create, imagine the momentum that's created from this. It's really amazing and it's very, very powerful. So I looked at uh, some numbers. Uh, so there's a pitch book, which is um, a, a data source that, that is um, often referred to. And I looked at, okay, it's a, probably a good indication of uh, some absolute values of since 2010, how many companies were funded with less than $5 million in Silicon Valley was about 1,600, 1,600 companies. And then I looked at Europe. So since 2010, that same sort of cohort, how many companies were funded with less than $5 million in Europe? And that was about 4,000. So then I say, you know, you can't really still compare. I mean, this is like apples and oranges. It's like Europe and the Valley. So, so let's just look at which sort of cities would add up to approximately the same. And that was London, Stockholm, Berlin, and Paris. There's about 1,500 companies. So it means, I mean, the opportunity in Europe is absolutely huge. Just think about some of the companies that have come out of Denmark, like the Unity guys, like the Realm guys that are happening now, and some of the exits that have happened over time that I'm going to talk about in a moment. So the thing that I think a lot about is, you know, fast forward, 12 months, and it's been 101 flights since I got here. So that's one of the big differences with Europe and the Valley as well. Here as a venture capital, you go out to meet the companies and the Valley people come see you. And th that's a really important factor because it takes a lot of blood, sweat and tears to go out and see everybody. Of course it does. When the Valley, again, this momentum and this sort of proximity makes it very easy to know everything that's going on. But had you asked me eight years ago, nine years ago when I left, sort of like what was missing in Europe for, for this entrepreneurial spirit, it was really the appetite for risk. And it was this whole sort of, um, you know, fear of failing that was very prevalent and um, which we had in our systems. And that has completely evaporated. I mean, every student you go and talk to has thought about an idea, working on an idea, has a friend who's working on something, and it's everywhere in Europe. So it doesn't matter if you're in Lisbon, if you're in anywhere in Europe, in Budapest, anywhere you have people thinking about it, students thinking about it. So, you know, the, the big shift that's happened is it's cool to be an entrepreneur now. It wasn't the case before. And that was something that has really completely changed the game for us. You know, when I told my mom I was going to join a taxi company, she wasn't particularly excited about that. <laughs> it took me a little bit of time to explain her that. Um, and, and less so when she started to see it on TV, in the news. Um, so, you know, it doesn't matter. You're in Berlin, Barcelona, Budapest. People are starting up ideas. It's amazing. The energy is incredible now. So we have that sort of gravitational force that I was talking about before that we feel in the valley. And, you know, 
the question I asked myself when becoming a VC is like, how could I, how could I sort of fuel this coolness? You know, my, my, the job I've been doing before with these three companies was I, I was, I was doing all the non-organic growth. So that means I would go out and find companies to work with, big company, companies to work with, big partnerships, and then create distribution, create like partnerships to, to grow the company with all on top of the organic growth, right, that was already happening. And the big question is then, you know, what's the difference between being uh, an entrepreneur and a VC? And it starts with, as an entrepreneur, you're just thinking about today, you, you know, you're trying to avoid the landmines that are right in front of you, and you're maybe thinking about tomorrow, but you're dealing with a lot of stuff right now on your desk. And as a VC, you're thinking more sort of like the long game. You're thinking about, okay, what are the trends here? You know, how does this fit into what's going on in the world right now, etc.? It's a much more long game that you are involved in. And that's a really big shift in, the, in persona almost. And, you know, when I think about the funnel that we've gone through as a firm, we saw, to give you, just to put it into context, in the last year we've seen 5,000 companies at Boulderton. We have uh, had partner meetings with 300 companies. We've had 30 companies come in and present to the partnership, and then we vote good old-fashioned style on, you know, and of course discussions and so on, on, on the investment. And so it leads to 10 investments. So we go from, the funnel is from 5,000 people and companies all the way down to 10 investments a year. So, it's, so we meet a lot of people and get a lot of signal. The, the next point in the difference between being an operator and a VC, so like again, this dual persona, is the tunnel vision you have, you have as an entrepreneur. You're sort of like you're hunting for this, you know, gold pot at the end of the rainbow, and you're just so focused on that. You get this tunnel vision. You know everything about that gold pot, but you don't see anything else. It's all you see. And as a VC, it's completely the opposite. It's sort of like you open up the funnel and you meet a lot of companies doing a lot of different things and you try to get an idea of is there, you know, does this fit into something big or not. So it's completely opposite. Then the final point is, again, from my personal point of view, with the strategic alliances, you're obviously very opportunistic. You're always the small one working with the bigger company and trying to find out what are your leverage points. What, what are the negotiation points where you have some thing of value that they need? And one of them is innovation. As a small company, you really have something large companies very often don't have, which is innovation. It's massively powerful and it's worth a lot. And that's sort of like once you, you, you sort of stand there and you look up at Goliath and you are thinking, you know what, I, I got something that you need. I may be small, but I got something you need and it's super valuable to you. And that's innovation. And of course, as a VC, the hardest part of the job is definitely saying no. Because I mean, imagine you're meeting so many people who are, I mean, they're working their, you know, their, their eyes out for this baby. And, you know, and it makes so much sense, right? Back to the lenses. And then as a VC, you know, for a variety of reasons, it may not really work with what else is in the pipeline or whatever is going on, and you have to say no. It's a really hard thing. But it's also about focus. And that's what we have to be as well. So me, Specifically, my focus is on Scandinavia, and you will enjoy two details here. One is the Schleswig-Holstein border has moved down a little bit, and the other uh, point is that uh, Fyn and Schellen is not part of this, which, which is a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the key, the, the thing I'm really excited about here is the, the evolution, the evolution in the region, right? And, of course, I'm passionate about the region for, for, for personal reasons, but the, the real core is the opportunity of what's going on in the region here. It's huge. And the pace of evolution is accelerating. And that leads me to my sector focus, which is around mobile and self-driving cars, autonomous vehicles. So on mobile, first of all, I mean, I think we would all agree that um, we have the DNA in the region that always thinks about design. It's like embedded into our, 
you know, organic cosmos, really. We think about design, that's what mobile is about. It's about the simplicity of the design and sort of like back to owning that part of the brain that refers to the triggers of an action to a service, right? I think we, are, we have something really special in Scandinavia around that. And then, you know, very basic things, just like, I mean, the smartphone penetration in Scandinavia is one of the highest in the world. We launched in 5G as one of the first areas in the world as well which means then suddenly you start to make other things possible. I mean, you know, if you didn't have better handsets and better networks, none of the three companies that I mentioned before, they would ever have been able to exist. They would ever have launched. So it's back to the timing. So what does it mean that we suddenly have a 5G network and the phones are faster and et cetera and cheaper at the same time? But the thing that, that I always felt, I don't know how many of you would, would agree with me on this, but when the iPhone launched in 2007, I, I sort of thought of it as just this perfect design that they had hit straight out of the gate. And what I mean by that is, think about a raindrop, like water falling through the air. And the raindrop is it's, it's like nature's answer to the perfect shape for water falling through the air, if it's more than zero degrees. And I sort of feel the iPhone, they sort of hit it out of the gate. They really did such an amazing job with their first version that, I mean, look at them now. It's still an incredible product, but the difference between the last version of the iPhone and the latest version, I mean, let's be honest. It's the incremental difference is smaller and smaller, right? But guess what? There will be another form factor. Like within the next 10 years, somebody right now, this is what is really exciting. Somebody right now, maybe in here, is working on a new form factor for a phone or a communication device, a content device, which everybody is going to use. That's amazing. I mean, it's amazing. It's really exciting, right? And we will, we will experience that in the next decade. Don't know what it looks like. Is it sort of like a, you know... R2-D2 Star Wars sort of hologram thing? Is it tied into our clothes? Is it in our ears? Like, what is it? I have no idea, but I want to find it. <laughs> so when you invent it, please come to me and talk to me. <laughs> and the second one is the autonomous driving. And, you know, having been at Uber, this was something we obviously was very, it was like core to our existence. And the really incredible thing, when we talk about timing again, is there's a trillion dollar industry at risk right now. They're going through an existential crisis. So the auto manufacturer that does not have an answer to the autonomous driving 10 years from now, they're gonna be, they're gonna be evaporated. It's amazing, that really opens up some interesting opportunities. And think about the Elliot. I don't know how many remember the Elliot. Show of hands. All right, good. <laughs> I was a bit nervous about that. But with a little bit of a stretch of imagination, you could say that was the precursor to the Tesla. <laughs> you know, Fisker, as you know, another Dane, uh, I think he's in LA. He's just launching a new electric car as well. It was like in the news today, you know, over 600 kilometers on one charge. I mean, things are really moving fast. So back to the people, the companies who do not have an answer to this, they will be dinosaurs. And, and think, when you really think about you know, what does it actually mean, it means suddenly we don't, you know, in big cities, you don't need parking spaces. You, you can start to, you don't need that infrastructure anymore, right? Think about, um, you know, drink driving, think about all the deaths, think about pollution, think about just efficiency of resources. I mean, it's really got, you know, one thing, you could think about is like if you have a shop and you want to sell something, you don't need to be on the high street anymore because there's like an autonomous vehicle that comes and pick up your goods and sell them. The person doesn't even care. I just want my pizza. <laughs> so that's something that's really very, very core. And you can sort of look at it as the cardiovascular system of the cities, as Uber says. And then, you know, think about trucks, just the final point on the autonomous driving. So, Trucks driving across the highway, so it means you don't have little kids running around after their balls and so on. I mean, it's just like straight driving for, you know, how many hours. And a large part of the cost of running a, uh, like a fleet of trucks is fuel. And if you get the cars to drive, the trucks to drive really close to each other, it's called platooning. Then you get, like you see in the cyclist, you get like the, the slipstream. It basically reduces the fuel consumption, right? 
And you don't have to think about, again, turning suddenly right or left or avoiding stuff in the same frequency as, as you do in a, in a city. So there are massive opportunities there. And again, it's about evolution. It's like we're seeing this happening right now in front of us. Some people say that the impact that autonomous driving will have like compares to the Industrial Revolution. And we can't see it now because we're standing on this side of that happening, of that moment. But it, it feels like it could be that big. And talking about evolution, who would have thought you know, all the messaging clients that we have right now? And the really amazing thing is, it's sort of like, it's not one client eats the other one's lunch. It's like the market is expanding. So you do WhatsApp with some, you do Snapchat with others, you do iMessenger with others. You sort of like, and, and it's really difficult to explain why do you use one service over the other. And um, as I was uh, thinking about this, and I thought about sort of like the, the value that's being created, uh, Snapchat, as, as you probably know, they are thinking about going public now. They're starting to put some numbers on the table and they're talking about $35 billion as one of their limits of going public. It's sort of like what they're aiming for, $35 billion. And I think TDC is about $4 billion, to put it in, in comparison. Right? So here you have a service that's built on top of somebody who just plowed billions of dollars so we have physical mass and good network and so on. And they are sort of like 10 times, eight to nine times as valuable. And then the crazy thing that's happened is there are businesses, again, that are building on top of the messaging services that are going to be even more valuable than the messaging services themselves. We're seeing that in China now with all the e-commerce and so on. So it's sort of like this evolution is just happening faster and faster and faster. And one company, Dub Smash, top right-hand corner, sort of like really nailed it for me in observing another trend in Europe. And there was one of the founders, so one of the top guys there, he's a valley guy, and he's moved to Europe. He's moved to Berlin. And that's another trend that's going on right now with the returning valley veterans. So we have people going to the valley, you know, with the dream, and people come back with the experience and the network of, of like this ecosystem, of that energy and density that I was talking about before, and bring it back here, which is fantastic. And I've seen it everywhere in Europe. I mean, all the cities I've been to, everywhere I've seen an example of that. And I'm really encouraged by it. And the, the, the moment that really brought it home to me was uh, right after the Paris attacks in November. And we had a big event, we do this uh, quite often, where we bring in a lot of entrepreneurs in a room, we just throw a lot of, I mean, free booze, it's almost unfair, so of course a lot of people come. But, and we just get people together to network and get to know each other and just uh, cry on each other's shoulders. And one of the guys who was there, Florian, he was uh, the first engineer from Box. So, I mean, me having been at Dropbox, I mean, we were fighting every day and night. So he, this guy, was the reason I was up at night. And the same he felt for me. And suddenly we both come back to Europe and we're on the same team, we're on Team Europe. And then just to sort of like make that experience even stronger, we had, you know, a, a tech guy standing pitching us like for the Dropbox and the box killer. <laughs> we were sort of standing there and giving him advice. What else do you do? And the thing that's happening with this sort of like ecosystem is the, there's a new wave of tech mafia starting to appear. And what I mean by that, it was sort of like a term that was coined with the PayPal mafia. So it means all the PayPal guys, they really work close together and they went off to do other greater things, but they always had each other's back. I mean, you know what it feels like. If you get to know people really well, you're in the same class together, you work together, of course you help each other. That's what friends are for, right? And that continues like that as well. So suddenly, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch your back. We're like, let's help each other, win this together, even though we're all doing different things. And that's starting to happen here now. It's, it's still very early, the signal is early. So if you look at a company like Spotify, sort of like they're probably on the older part of the cohort of startups in Europe, but you're starting to see spin-ups from Spotify with people saying, hey, you know what, let's go and start something else up. 
and it's starting to spin up. I think in, in Denmark we have Podio as an example, and I'm sure there are other examples we can we could come up with as well. Now you have to imagine sort of the sound of a, a gramophone player and the sort of the needle suddenly scratches across, because then there's a big butt. And the but is that the exits happen in Europe. Sorry, in the valley. So they happen in the US. They happen on New York Stock Exchange. They happen on NASDAQ. They don't happen here. And how can you possibly have like a crazy momentum with startup system and where the startups are the prosperity future and yet the exits happen over there? I don't think you can. So then the question is, okay, so how do we change that? <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> and the best answer I've got to that right now is from a very practical point of view, is back to some of these folks who've gone over to the US and who've made, in some cases, billions of dollars, and they, you know, come back to Europe with their black bags full of dollar bills. And we don't have to look very far to look for these people. There's the Zendesk guys, there's the Success Factor guys, there's plenty of folks, just even from here, who've done that. And I think part of the answer to getting the exits to happen over here is to get some of the people who've really done it big, who've really stretched like the pain membrane and come, have them come back here and say, you know what? A acquisition for a hundred billion dollars is peanuts. And when you think about it, right? I mean, think about Facebook. Think about Facebook's acquisition of Instagram. There was a billion dollars, and I think it was 10, 12 people. I'm sure there are more people in here who know about that. And that was just, it seemed like an incredible acquisition. How is that possible that a little app, a little, you know, half by half centimeter little icon could be worth a billion dollars? But in hindsight, it was absolutely brilliant. First of all, the service is still used by everybody, practically. Secondly, you had like Facebook's sort of pain member pushed out a little bit. So this pain was no longer a billion dollars, it became 19 billion dollars, and that's what led to the WhatsApp acquisition. The WhatsApp acquisition, this is a personal opinion, the WhatsApp acquisition I don't think would have had high, as high a likelihood of happening if the Instagram deal hadn't happened before that. First of all, it was a massive number, but there was also, I mean, just from the guys at WhatsApp, they sort of saw, you know what, this Instagram thing is really working within a bigger company. And then just to have the guts to take that decision to buy a company with 50 people or something for $19 billion, imagine what you went through. But you had to have stretched that pain membrane as well. And this is what I mean, that we need to get people to come back here home to us and help us stretch that pain membrane so we can take some bigger risks and that we will eventually feel good about sort of acquisitions, M&A, and sort of create this exit market momentum. And then there are practicalities like, you know, maybe the Deutsche um, Stock Exchange acquiring other stock exchanges and so on. All of this is going on as well. You could say in the US you have NASDAQ is like one fits all in the New York Stock Exchange. We don't quite have that here, right, from a practical point of view. But it leads me to my last point, and that is, it's inevitable that Europe will be producing billion dollar companies at the same rate that we're seeing in the valley today. It's the, I call it digital Darwinism. It's, it's like a natural evolution. You think about this, you know, the cool to be an entrepreneur point I made before. You know, the, think about the tech hubs I was mentioning before, like this momentum that's being built up everywhere, and the Valley veterans returning as well, with their network, with their money, all of these things, experience this pain membrane, and that's gonna lead to the exits. And this is really the core, again, back to why, you know, I came back here, I left from being an entrepreneur to a VC, back from the Valley to Europe, because I truly believe, I mean, it's, it's, we see it in nature that startups will be the growth engine for European prosperity. It's digital Darwinism. You know, Europe's moment has come. 
And with that, I want to say it's up to all of us to do it in this room. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lars. That was a, was a very positive note to, to end on, that we are here in Europe, and uh, that's where the future, the future of, uh, of this tech uh, revolution lies. Um, we, I've received uh, many questions. Uh, some of them are here. And um, I'll start out with, yeah, OK, just move to the top. Uh, we talked about this on our way over here. Um, <laughs> The three biggest career mistakes uh, you've made, uh, Lars. Uh, could you please, uh, could you please outline what they are? <laughs> I know there are multiple more, but uh, yeah. just the three worst. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to process all the others. I'm like, all right, good luck. <laughs> um, what's the three biggest career mistakes? So first of all, let me let me let me do something. I'm going to because I want to make sure that I I spend time thinking about this. I'm gonna. Uh, think down and really be thoughtful about the answers, write it down and send it here and make sure it's shared with everybody. So it's, it gets a lot of, a lot of, a lot of thought of that. Um, one of the things, um, this is very personal, that I went through, and which is really important, and I've sort of like learned that the hard way, was, I mean, I sacrificed my family for this. You know, I'm 43 today, and when I started in the Valley, I was already uh, feeling old, so to speak. Right? I had like one little girl, Emily, and my wife, we, we, all three of us, we moved over there. And I mean, we were talking about the story first. The first day I went to the valley, the, the, my, my sort of welcome to the office was like, hey, sorry, Lars, we run out of money, dude. <laughs> like, great. <laughs> and, you know, and it, but for me, it was like, I wasn't going to go back to Europe again. I'd say goodbye, and I wanted to stay over there. I wanted to be part of this journey, of this mission. Um, but what happened sort of like in the process of that was that I sacrificed absolutely everything to, um, you know, to be part of it. It's, it's very, it felt very binary. And, and the, the cost with that, of course, is that you're not with your family, right? With my little girl and, you know, I have three kids today and, um, you know, the 101 flights doesn't help me a lot today. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm learning from what I did, but that was one thing. The sacrifice was very, very high. On, on the family. Um, the, the other um, sort of some, if I think about some things I would have liked to do different again was um, on a very practical point of view. I was, um, you know, engineers, the companies I, I worked at, like the engineers like ruled the companies and I was a business guy and I do have an engineering degree but again I didn't tell that to anybody. They would have laughed at me if I'd said it. But it was really about sort of creating this bond between the non-engineering and the engineering. Engineering is like, as, 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 as you know, it's very analytical, it's very logical, and, and you, can, you can model it out. Uh, whereas on the business side, we weren't thinking as much in, in those terms. And this, we, we learned that quickly. So these were some of the mistakes we did early on where we said at Dropbox, hey, let's go and do some really, really big deals. Um, and what that led to was, of course, a lot of friction with the engineering, and the engineering teams would say, but hang on a second, we have a roadmap here, we don't have any more engineers, we have, you know, we're, 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 we're maxed out, we can't do this, we can't work to other people's deadlines and so on. And that was something that we learned and that I would encourage highly, and I've obviously used that model ever since, like really try to model out the impact of the initiatives that you're going on, and remember the million other resources that are already applied, that have already been taken. So the thing that you're working on is not necessarily the most important, right? So really build it up in an, in an analytical way. Um, and then probably the biggest mistake I ever did was straight out of college, I went into consulting because I thought that was the most amazing thing for me to do. <laughs> and I lasted four months. I mean, so I didn't follow my passion. I didn't follow what I really cared about, which was technology and sort of fast moving things and really exciting building stuff and things. It just wasn't me. So I didn't follow the thing I really loved, loved doing. That was my biggest mistake of all of those. Yeah, and that leads us to the, to the next question. Could you sum up what, uh, what is your best advice for someone uh, 
who wants to ride the, the next digital wave. Yeah. So um, I have a lot of people asking me about this all the time. It's sort of like it's, it's normally disguised as, do you want to grab a coffee? I'm drinking a lot of coffee. And, uh, and I've, I've been through this myself, right? I mean, I've changed jobs so many times, I've lost count now, until I really found the thing that I gelled with, the people that I, I love working with, and, and the, the mission that I was working on, right? So I would, I changed jobs a lot. And I sort of started to feel a little bit like, what am I doing here? You know, I need to find sort of my, <laughs> my meaning, right? Time is running out. And I often think about it as sort of like, Olympic periods, like four, you know, four year periods. I say, you know what, you've got four years worth of high power, like really use it on the thing where you can have the biggest impact. And the way to think about it, at least for me and the advice I offer is like, again, first start with something you're really passionate about. Start, to, start with a mission that you're really passionate about, an area you really care about. Maybe you have some connection to something, something you really believe in. And then start, you know, from a very practical point of view, you can be quite analytical about how you apply that. And first you just start with, you know, writing down a bunch of companies you think are cool. And you think, this could be fun, this sounds interesting, I've read about it. It's sort of like very, very light touch, but there's something you think that could be a good fit with you. And then you start to be more analytical about it. And you say, okay, and, and one very good way of doing that, and again, I, I've, I've done this and I've seen many people go through this, is go through, you know, take the top couple of VCs in the areas that, in the geographies where you want to work, you know, in the US with the Sequoias and the benchmarks, etc. And, and in Europe, you take a couple of the top VCs as well, take the three or something, and then go through their portfolio. So look at which companies have they invested in, because it's typically a, uh, it's sort of like a filter for something that could really be impactful and big, otherwise those companies wouldn't have, have done it. And then you have a list of, let's say you have a list of um, 50 companies by then, because some of the companies you just, you don't want to work there, whatever. And then you think about, um, do, they, do they fit into the size of company you want to work at? So how many employees do they have? Do you, know, do you feel more comfortable with something that has a couple of hundred employees, it's a little safer, or something that, you know what, we're going to just go in this, there are 10 people and we're going we're gonna to rule the world now. Right, so where, where does it fit in? Where's your comfort zone? And the, the way to think about it is like the classroom size, right? Is 30 your number where you know everybody, etc. And, and you know, that pro can probably extend it up to 100 people. You will sort of know everybody up to 100 people. It's something we thought a lot about at Dropbox. When you hit the 100, like just over 100, we start not to know people in the corridor anymore. And the people who have meetings with, they're introducing themselves for the first time in the same company. So think about the size of the company. And then, of course, geography, how close is it to where you live or do you want to go there, you know, etc. just from a very practical point of view. And then think about the, how much money has been invested in the company. Because um, that part of sort of like the, the game, so to speak, is to get in really early and obviously exit as late as possible. And, um, you know, but there is more risk at the early stage. So a company that's got, let's say, $5 million has, uh, you know, generally a lot more risk than a company that's got $50 million, right? So you can be very sort of analytical about it. And then once, let's say you come down to a list of 10 companies, something like that, in the sector that you want, you know, with the size of team that you want, got the investors that you want, it's got the kind of money, so you, know, you get paid as well on the way. And then you say, okay, so at this company A, who do I know there? And how am I connected to this company even? And you, you know, go to LinkedIn. And this is why the networking, this is why this is really important because it, for everybody to help each other and go to LinkedIn and see if you're connected to somebody, maybe second degree, first degree, who can help you with an interest to somebody. And don't do it um, sort of like, make it very specific. Say, I would really love to talk about this uh, product manager about like an idea I have, I think they should do something like this, have they thought about it or something like that. Get, get, like a, get a hook in for the introduction and help the person who's introducing you with, with some material, with some content that will likely be received well on the, other, on the other side. And then it's about practice. Then I mean the interview process is, I'm, I'm, I'm sure most have tried it in here, it's really hard and you get better with it as you practice, so you don't want to take the, the one you really, really want, you don't want that to be the first one you go into the interview with. 
So there's no bragging rights of, hey, um, you know, I, um, I, I got my, the first job that I wanted. I mean, no, don't, don't think about it that way. Just literally, it's a, it's a practice, um, you know, um, exercise, I would say. Is that useful? Maybe. Any questions specific to that? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, so um, if I ask, if, if I sort of heard you right, sort of what the difference with sort of like the Eastern, Eastern Europe compared to Western. So, and, and we go there as well. I mean, I was, uh, I, I go to Budapest quite a lot, uh, as an example. Um, and, and the reason for that is there are amazing engineering schools there, which means that the foundation for the startup scene is really big. And back to sort of the autonomous driving point I made before, there are a lot of companies working on the auto industry there. And then you have a lot of startups in that area as well. So you have amazing engineers at a fifth of the price working on something that's disrupting a billion dollar industry. And you know, we see that everywhere in the, in, in the, I can't say everywhere, but we see that generally in Eastern Europe, that it's amazing engineers <coughs> and that are a lot cheaper. So we're starting to see more happening from that. And of course, a lot of people over there move over here as well, right? And, and then they sort of get into the system and then, you know, eventually go to the US if they want and so on as well. So we're, I mean, we go, we go everywhere. I mean, we go to Poland, we go everywhere. I would like to, um, to merge two questions. The first one uh, on, on top here, like, is there a common denominator for all the companies that Balderton uh, has invested in? Uh, you know, a, a characteristic that's really uh, everywhere or many places and uh, a question that's a bit further down. Uh, what is your favorite company in your portfolio and why? Yeah, <laughs> so um, the, I mean the main characteristics with uh, some of the companies we have is that they're small, the ones that we invest in, and that means it's series A. So all of them come in at the series A at the very early stage, they're all tech, it's all European founders, and they all have global ambitions. So they're all working on something really, really big, uh, that has a big potential. And um, you know, we, we then have sort of like clusters of companies, we probably have the biggest FinTech uh, portfolio in, uh, in Europe, full stop. And um, so if it's something that you're interested in, FinTech, I mean, go again, look through the companies that we've invested in, see what's interesting, they're all exploding. I mean, they're really going through a massive growth right now. Um, we also have a bunch of consumer, uh, one company to sort of merge in a little bit to the, to the next uh, question you had, a Roly. Uh, so this is like a, a little device where you can sort of create new music. It's sort of like the, on the notion that, you know, just like when the, when basically when Nokia came out with the, with the camera and the mobile phones, everyone had a sort of like inner photographer. Everyone loved taking it. Think about how many pictures we take now. And, and their notion is everybody has like the inner musician and everybody should be making music and would love to make music if they could, if they had the tools for it. So they've launched these like little bricks now where you can basically compose and you can put the bricks together and make really cool music. And they just um, announced a couple of days ago that they're gonna be in all the Apple stores over Christmas. So, and um, I think it's about $180 or something. So it's, uh, I think it'll be a really cool uh, Christmas present. We're really excited about, really excited about them. But there's no sort of like from a theme point of view, we, it's like just early tech and really passionate, people are really passionate about what they do. And then, you know, another company, Vivino, a uh, Danish company, that's one of our companies as well. I mean, you know, who doesn't like wine sort of thing. And uh, they are just doing really well. The really interesting thing with those guys particularly is uh, they're in a vertical, they're in a wine vertical. And it's something that's, you know, when, when we look at companies that are in verticals, like how can they monetize? And you often think about, you know, if you have a golf company, you know, they just get every golfer to come in there and look at, um, you know, how to improve their game, how to buy stuff and so on, automotive, I mean, you know, fishing, sports, anything. And it's really difficult to monetize. And it's, but the Vivino guys have really managed uh, to do that. So it's very, so they're sort of setting the examples for many people. It's just a bunch of cool people, it's super fun to hang out with and so on. <laughs>
Um, a question that I uh, find very interesting as well is on, on top here from Akshay Jody. I don't know if I could pronounce that correctly. Uh, is timing about luck, or can you actually figure out uh, what's going to be the focus industry? And just uh, um, I, I read some Malcolm Gladwell. I, I can recommend that to everyone who, who hasn't read it, who describes trends in a really interesting way. And something I found very interesting was that he said that the richest people in the world were born within a different uh, time range. Like the, the richest people ever born were born in the 18th uh, uh, century, I don't know, or 19th century, but it was like when the US economy was booming, uh, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, uh, Steve Ballmer, former Microsoft CEO, they were born within a five year time frame, and if they weren't born there, they probably wouldn't have built the companies they did. So it, it seems like there's a bit, of, a lot of luck as well, at least the way Malcolm Gladwell describes it. How can you, like, dodge that and make sure you get the right timing? I, I mean, I think that's, that's true. And uh, I, you know, I've been trying to distill down on, on the final point I made with the with the three companies. Like, what was what was the timing elements? What does the timing consist of? And luck is absolutely one of them, right? But um, one thing I, I would say um, about the timing, maybe because the luck is a little bit harder to 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 sort of uh, quantify. Um, but. And this comes back a bit to the question about sort of career advice. One, one thing that happens a lot in the Valley is you can, you can become an advisor. An advisor becomes typically, you know, you don't get anything paid, but you maybe get a little bit of stock. So you're sort of like, you're incentivized along with the company. And um, you get to meet the team. You get to see the product from the inside. You get to see the numbers as well. How much is this really growing? What's really happening under the hood here? It's like test driving a car. You get to, how does this accelerate? You know, how does it break? How does it, how does it open the door? Whatever. And, and that's something that I, could, that I could recommend, sort of like that approach to say, hey, you know what? I would really like to come in and help you guys with design or with product or something like that. And it's not an internship. This is like post-internship -inter phase. It's more so like as an advisor and be associated with that company and help that company. And this is a, a way that you can, this, this, I did that with all the three companies and many more uh, that didn't work out. Um, and, but you really get a sense of, you know, what is the DNA, what's the culture like? It's super difficult to go and uh, sit on an interview and get a sense of the culture. You can, you can get some signals and you meet the people, but I mean, they are selling in there, right? So you don't get like the real sort of like temperature of what's going on behind the scenes. And, and becoming an, an advisor, you, you get a sense of that. What's the culture like? What are people like? What are they talking about? What's you know, going on at the water cooler and so on? So that answers a little bit here. But back to the timing, I mean, with, with, with the companies that I work with, I really got to see, okay, these guys, they're just about to explode now. I mean, you could really see the numbers like, wow, this is real. Because often, of course, companies, they can't, in most cases, pr the private companies, they don't talk about the milestones or the growth that they're necessarily going through. They want to keep that under the hood for, for a variety of reasons. And, uh, but here you get a sense of, of, of that growth. And then the, the, your timing and picking the right company becomes really critical before the next round of funding, before the next sort of explosion happens. And then, you know, and, and, you know, and I, I do want to bring up another point, which we didn't touch on here. You know, all of this depends on like what's really driving you as well. What's really important to you, right? Because uh, me, as, as an investor now, it's all about creating this growth, this financial growth, because it's part, you know, that feeds into the bigger picture of, you know, I want my kids to live in a better Europe, right? My little, my little kids. And, and I do think startups has a very fundamental, um, they're, they're a big part of the equation there. But, uh, you know, but I, I shouldn't over assume that it's all about money. It's all about making a lot of it and so on, right? It's also just very simple about working on something you really care about. So, and, and, and picking like a mission that you're really passionate about, whatever it is, whether it's education, whether it's healthcare, what, what, you know, something that really means something to you and that will have like some benefits that are not financial. I mean, that's, that's, uh, it's important to, to remember that. Um, we're about to run out of time. I have, uh, thank you very much for all the great questions. I'm sorry I haven't uh, highlighted them all. Um, I hope maybe I, we can send, I can send them to you and uh, yes, you can uh, reply on one of the, the plane trips you're on, maybe. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, what is most important in this like, digital age, I imagine that's the thought behind uh, this, that there's all this information about us that we share with companies and governments and, and stuff like that, and how is that related to like, the power of, of, of safety? Uh, uh, can it, uh, please correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong about the dilemma here, um, but uh, yeah, could you please touch upon that? And then one last question afterwards. Should I uh, quit my job at TV2 and try to be a digital yes. Like, uh, yes. startup <laughs> guy? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I mean, honestly, th this question, I, I, I acknowledge the question. I think we all share the concerns of privacy, and I think we all, uh, you know, we've all seen sort of like the uh, what's going on in the world today. And I mean, with, uh, you know, it's everything from governments to individuals that are involved in it. Honestly, I can't answer the question. I, I'm, I'm not sure anybody can answer that question. You know, it, it feels like a thing that we just all have to think about, like even from the product stage, from the design stage, and all the way to, uh, you know, across all the functions. It's just, it's, it's, just a, it's just a critical, critical thing, and it applies to absolutely every industry right now. So it's, it's, a, it's one of those functions that are, that are existential to every company now. So it's it's um, that's that's the that's the best I can do on that answer, unfortunately. And uh, about me, should I uh, should I quit? Let's, let's go start now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have to talk with my girlfriend about that. She just <laughs> got pregnant, so. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Lars. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>